is an Oxford ethicist who argues that married couples should have the right to take ecstasy in order to save their marriages. Any couple now, should have a right. Any adult should have a right. Okay, I, I agree with you on that. I think that all drugs should be legalized and regulated. Uh, that way we don't have um, you know this black market for drugs, which is why drug cartels are so successful in Mexico. But that's a completely different story. We're gonna focus on a lighter side of this. And what Brian Earp is arguing is that now, more than ever before, people are living longer. And as a result, their marriages go through decades and decades of grueling <laughs> right. hard work. And it becomes more and more difficult to keep you know, the marriage alive. It's harder to connect with your significant other. So using MDMA could really help you know, foster a healthier relationship. Yeah. And of course, he's saying that you should do so under um, you know, medical supervision, and you should do so in, in a, a responsible way. Right. If, even if you've exhausted all other avenues of right. bridging that gap and keeping the relationship together. I mean, I think that's a fascinating point that couples are staying together and living longer than ever before. Because like, right. I think you even talk like, till death do you part, like, that was an easy commitment to make when it was like, ah, oh, we maybe got like 17 years together. I could handle that. Yeah, right. I could get together for that. Now it's like 60 years? Right. What are we going to do? I mean, Lost yeah. is done. We've got nothing to talk about totally, anymore. Totally, totally. And think about when the kids are out of the house right. and you, you now have to focus on one another, something that maybe you didn't do while you were raising the kids. Sure. You kind of become disconnected. I see it happen all the time. Um, and by the way, like my parents have been together for 30 years. We just celebrated their anniversary. Very nice. And I was thinking to myself, like, geez, you guys have been married for 30 years. Right. That's incredible. How do people do that? And you guys, so, oddly enough, to celebrate, went to an Olive Garden and all took ecstasy. Yeah, which I it think was great. It is was fantastic. Great. I mean, you already feel it. like family when you're there. <laughs> but under when you're rolling, man, soup salad and breadsticks, put it on me. Nothing says uh, celebrating a 30th wedding anniversary like dancing on a table at an Olive Garden. Yeah. yeah. Playing Gognum style on your phone. <laughs> oh, um, no. So anyway, this is a really interesting point of view from this ethicist, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, Totally agree. So you've experienced uh, MDMA. I have indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I have indeed. On purpose, kids. I actually did. Um, you know, this, this is a drug that was discovered mostly by accident in like 1912. Mm -hmm. And then was literally left on a shelf for almost 10 extra years. Then they kind of brought it back and did studies on what it could do for muscle relaxation and the way blood sugar interacts with it. Yeah. Then, then our own CIA, our own military did studies on it to see if- In the if, 50s, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's true. I, there's a great book about uh, our, our government using acid, methamphetamine, MDMA. Uh, it's called uh, Acid Dreams, brilliant book. But there's this MK Ultra a project where they administered MDMA to people, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, without even their knowledge or consent if they were prisoners. And the idea was, well, this can relax them. We can pull out information out of them. It well, was used as a truth serum. Yeah. And yeah. at the same time, these like nefarious, kind of shitty and shady studies were going on. Uh, actual uh, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists were doing studies with them. Relationship behavioral, behavioral therapists were using it. And they found that because it opens you up and sort of floods your body with natural serotonin, it makes you open to feel and it, it removes some of the walls you may have built up, and it was the perfect therapy drug. Yeah, there, there were a lot of really shady things uh, going on with the DEA in uh, the mid-1980s. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, first of all, interesting thing, when, when MDMA was discovered, it was by Merck in Germany, okay? So Merck Pharmaceuticals, you guys are aware of them. And as you mentioned, it was kind of under the radar for a very, very long time. And in the 70s, you know, these psychiatrists started using it, and it became very popular. All of a sudden you see ecstasy pills being passed around in the party scene in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Dallas of all places, right? So people are partying, they're popping the pills, they're dancing to- What's this one got in a cowboy hat? Oh, that's Texan. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it becomes very popular in Dallas and the DEA finds out about it and they're like, no, yeah. you're not allowed to have fun. So I love that you mentioned the shady studies because the, prior to the DEA getting involved in this, uh, there was like one study involving rats and they were like pumped with like copious amounts of MDMA and it showed, oh look, it damages them. Yeah, if you get pumped with copious amounts of anything, you, there'll, right. there, there'll, there'll probably be yeah. a little Caffeine, bit of damage. Caffeine, sugar, alcohol, nicotine, anything is a poison if right. you ingest buckets of it at a time. Exactly, but the DEA didn't care about that um, and, and they wanted to uh, classify it as a schedule one drug. Even though there was proof because these psychiatrists were using it, uh, there was proof that it had some medical value, but mm -hmm. they didn't care. They're gonna schedule it as a schedule one drug. And 
And not just in therapy, like there is documentation that it, it helped people that literally had had stuttering issues. Yeah. They could have a little bit of MDMA and sometimes it cured that. Now I'm not saying it's a, it's not cured. I mean, it would, yeah. it would temporarily uh, take care of the issue. I'm not saying that that's its main goal or purpose, but clearly it has some value. And for everybody who's a proponent of couples staying together because the, the, the sanctity of marriage or staying together for the kids, for the, the health and wellness of a family, why would you, why would you ever be opposed to a tool that someone could have in their arsenal to help maintain a healthy relationship? Also, you're absolutely right about that. Here's another thing that drives me crazy. If you legalize it and you regulate it, just like prostitution, right? you can create a safer environment for people who do want to take it. Because right now what's happening is, you think people stop taking ecstasy? People are still taking ecstasy. No. I mean, Kevin just it, admitted that. It's just um, mixed with baby yeah. diuretic. And let me tell you, that's, that's only fun for like three minutes. <laughs> and yeah, no, it's mixed with speed, it's mixed with terrible things. Yeah. And you know, it's like if, I, I, I hate that the government, not to get too soapboxy, but I just hate that they have this, that uh, we get to pick the poison. Right. We get to pick the poison for the profit. Oh, there's a huge lobbying arm to keep uh, th this particular drug legal or regulated in this capaci capacity, like like Oxy, which, mm -hmm. it, you know, kills <laughs> tons of people all the time and it's terribly addicting. Like, okay, we'll leave that legal and regulated on a shelf, but this other drug that someone might want to take for whatever their reason, now that one's, that one's not allowed.